to uh, welcome everyone to class this morning. Should have in front of you some notes that are uh, titled Lesson 95, Rightly Dividing H.A. Ironside, the publication of Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, Part 2. Um, so what we were doing last time with Lesson 94 is we started looking at the 1935 publication of um, wrongly divided the word of truth by H.A. Ironside, and we looked at the first, we looked at the introduction of the first three chapters. And so this morning, what I want to do is look at some other things regarded to it. Now, that there's some lengthy charts and stuff in here. We're not going to read all that stuff, but it, it'll be apparent to you what's going on there when we reach that point in the lesson. So we were looking at this. We said a lot of things last Sunday about what Ironside's critiques were of what he calls ultra dispensationalists. And, and so on. We want to continue to make sure we have a, a clear, accurate understanding of, of what he says with respect to that here. So chapter 4 of Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth is t was titled, um, When Was the Revelation of the Mystery of the One Body Given? So if you just look at point number 1, chapter 4 commences with a discussion of Bollinger's later teaching, The Foundations of Dispensational Truth, 1913 that the mystery of the one body was not revealed until Paul preached in Rome in 63 AD. The idea is combined with the notion that the Paul alone was the revelation of the mystery given, and that Peter and the eleven knew nothing of it. These are the dispensational contentions of Bollingerites and his ilk, according to Ironside. After pointing out that the mystery, that the mystery is referenced in Romans 16, 25-27, a book written during the Acts period, Ironside takes issue with Bollinger's postscript theory, i.e. the suggestion that these verses were added to the end of Romans after Paul reached Rome in Acts 28. Now we talked about the postscript theory already when we went through Bollinger. Um, I even went back at, uh, and wrote a paper on it uh, and made that available on the internet. I don't know but most of you, if you have Facebook or the internet, hopefully you were able to uh, access the paper. But this is what he says, so quoting now from Ironside his comments about Bollinger's postscript theory. Does anyone ask how any ultra dispensationalist dared to say in the face of such a scripture as this, that the mystery had not been made known and had not been previously preached before Paul was imprisoned at Rome? If a simple believing Christian, if a simple believing Christian, he will probably be amazed at the answer. Dr. Bollinger and others who follow him suggest that in all likelihood the last three verses of the epistle to the Romans were not written by Paul when he sent the letter uh, from some distant Gentile city, but that they were uh, appended to the letter after he reached Rome and received the new revelation. Is this, is this unbelievable? Nevertheless, it is exactly what these men teach. It is higher criticism of the worst type and impunges the perfection of the Word of God. For even supposing their contentions were true, how absurd it would be for Paul to add these words after he reached Rome to an epistle purporting to be written before he got there. And how senseless it would be for him to speak while he is in prison of a gospel and a revelation which he was supposed to have preached in all the world if he had never yet begun that proclamation. Nevertheless, to say that the contention of Dr. Bollinger is an absolute fabrication. It is the special pleading of hard-driven uh, controversialists bound to maintain his unscriptural system at all costs, even at destroying the unity of the Word of God. Now, a couple comments I want to make here. Number one, I think it is unfair of Ironside to say that everyone that followed Bollinger taught this postscript theory. Because there are Acts 28 dispensationalists that do not subscribe to Bollinger's postscript theory. So I think that's not necessarily true. You guys know where I stand on the postscript theory. I am not, I, I'm not a, uh, a, an adherent of it. I don't accept that it's correct. Okay, I told you that when we taught it and so on. Um, but I also feel that Ironside's representation of exactly what Bollinger says about the postscript theory is also not necessarily fair representation of what Bollinger actually wrote. Okay, So for the record, the Grace History Project does agree with Pastor Ironside on this point, and I'm going to amend this to say in part, Bollinger's postscript theory is false and should be rejected. 
Those interested in reading more about Bollinger's postscript theory are encouraged to read our essay titled, Did Paul Know the Mystery When He Wrote Romans? An Investigation of E.W. Bollinger's Postscript Theory. So two points, just to recap that. Number one, I don't think Ironside is fair by painting a broad brush and saying everybody that's X-28 agrees with Bollinger about the postscript theory, because I don't think that's true. I do agree with him that I think the postscript theory is false, but I also think that he's not necessarily fair in how he's representing what Bollinger actually said about it. So in addition, Ironside takes issue with Bollinger's exposition of Romans 12, 4 through 5, and 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. Both of these passages were written during the Acts period and mention the one body and speak of both the Romans and the Corinthians as being members of the one body. Regarding these passages, Ironside wrote, quote, Romans 12, 4 through 5, Could we have a clear declaration than this of the truth of the mystery? What ultra dispensationalists will dare to say is that this passage is an interpolation added in, he added in after years in order to make Romans fit with Ephesians. God's word is perfect and always exact. These unscriptural theorists, theorists invariably overlook something that completely destroys their unscriptural hypothesis. And then he says with respect to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, he says, It is absurd to say, as, this, as these ecclesiastical hobby writers do, that the body referred to here is not the same thing as the body of Ephesians and Colossians. It is a body made up of those who were formerly Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, but are now one in Christ. And this body has been formed by baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in another way, was the body of in no other way, sorry, was the body of Christ brought into existence. Coming back then to consider the passage in 1 Corinthians, we have, we have the truth of the body clearly set forth and are shown how it was brought into existence <coughs> in a letter written at least four years before Paul's imprisonment. And he writes the letter to a group of believers who had been brought to a knowledge of Christ through his preaching some years before. Now, so... You folks know that I am not an X-28. I do not teach or accept the X-28 position. And I, in these points here, would agree that I do think that the body of Romans, the body of 1 Corinthians, the same body of Ephesians, the same body of Colossians. Okay? But, again, this, this critique is of, the, is of what they were saying about it at the time. With respect to the revelation of the mystery, Ironside points out that it was Paul's, quote, devotion to the revelation of the mystery, which, was, which is part of the dispensation of the grace of God, that resulted in his imprisonment. He did not get his dispensation after he was in prison. Now, just real quick, just turn your Bible to Ephesians 3, just read verse 1. The reason he's saying that is because of Ephesians 3, 1, where Paul states the following... Ephesians 3.1, For this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you word. So what Ironside's point is basically this. The reason Paul's in prison when he writes the book of Ephesians is because of what he was teaching that, that wound him up in prison, as it were. So he's taking issue here with, with that. <coughs> He does, however, change his mind from his earlier writings with respect to Paul being the first one to know the mystery. In wrongly dividing the word of truth, Ironside states that both John and Peter also knew the mystery. Quote, Was this mystery made known to other servants besides the Apostle Paul? It was. Five. What? Not made known to, but made known oh, by. Oh, sorry. Made known by other servants besides the Apostle Paul. The Apostle John makes it known in his account of our Lord's ministry as given in the 10th chapter of his gospel. There we read that the Lord Jesus as the good shepherd entered into the sheepfold of Judaism to lead his own out into glorious liberty. And cryptically he adds, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and, they, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is perhaps the earliest intimation of the mystery that we have. It was not committed to writing, of course, until some years after, until some years after the epistle to the Ephesians was written. 
but it, but it shows us that John, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, had received the revelation of the mystery even before Paul, the apostle Paul did. Then, so, okay, let's stop there for a minute. So what's he saying? He thinks that because John remembered Jesus said that and understood it in light of Paul's gospel, that that means that John understood it the day he heard it. So he has someone knowing or understanding the mystery, even if they're not writing about it, before or did, while Jesus is still on, still on earth during his earthly ministry. Okay? So, notice the second paragraph, though. I, find, I don't know what to make of this. Notice the second paragraph in that quote. Read the first sentence with me. This is perhaps the earliest intimation of the mystery that we have. It was not committed to writing, of course, until some years after the epistle to the Ephesians was written. Now, wait a minute. Didn't he just argue that the, that the mystery of Romans 16 was the same mystery as Ephesians 3? So I have no idea what he even means when he says this, and I know that that quote is right because I got it. I, I there was there's a digital copy, and I just snagged it right out of the book and stuck it in there without changing anything. Yeah. I think he could simply be meaning that that he believes that John wrote down his gospel years after yeah, Paul finished. Writing. Okay. I, yeah. You're right. I could yes. So we'll go to the third paragraph now. That now he's going to address Peter. He says, Then what of the Apostle Peter? We dare to say that this mystery was made known to him on the housetop of Simon's residence in Joppa. That would be Acts 10. When he had the vision of the descending sheep from heaven and saw it in all manner of beasts and creeping things and heard the word from heaven. What God hath cleansed, call thou not common or unclean. This was to him an intimation that in Christ... The distinction between Jew and Gentile was henceforth to be done away, and he makes it perfectly clear that this was his conviction when he stood up to preach in the household of Cornelius, Acts 10, uh, verse 34 to the end. Moreover, his epistles emphasize the same fact, though not in the full way that those of the apostle Paul do. John and Peter are apostles. Are, uh, are there any prophets who give evidence of having in measure at least understood this truth? The greatest of all the New Testament pro prophets is Luke himself, and in his book of Acts, the mystery is plainly made known. Though not taught doctrinally, we see God working in grace to unite Jew and Gentile into one body. Um, so he's clearly saying here, that Paul was not the first one to understand the mystery. Okay? Um, Peter knew it. Luke knew it. John knew it. And all of these men knew it before who? Paul. Before Paul. That's what Ironside is saying. In chapter 5, titled Further Examination of the Epistles, Ironside states, Paul makes no claim to being the sole depository of the revelation of the mystery. He says it was made known to Christ's holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So we turn to consider the writings of other apostles and prophets asking, have we in them any information of a new revelation after Paul went to Rome? So these are the statements, as you'll see in a little bit when we get to the charts, that are going to really start to get Ironside in hot water with some of his contemporaries. Because, and I, I, only, I only brought three of the books with me this morning. The other two I had left at, at work. But if you line these books up on a timeline and start looking at what he said and when he said it, there is no doubt that what he is stating in 1935 when he writes Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth is a reversal from what he said before that. Okay, and we'll look at that here in a minute. But before we do and move on to the next couple chapters, are there any questions or comments about any of that in regarding the mystery? So those books are all written by Ironside before he wrote that? Not all of them. Oh. Romans and Colossians are. Ephesians <clears throat> is not. So and I'll show you this in a second. But the, the first edition of Colossians, which is what I have here, dates from 1929. 
The first edition of Romans dates from 1928, and he writes wrongly dividing in 1935. Beverly? Well, Luke traveled with Paul for a while. How long was Luke with him? Because I know he, he traveled with him some, but I mean, what he knew of the mystery, wouldn't he have learned it from Paul? I mean, how, I mean, how can he, Ironside claim that Luke knew it before Paul? Yeah, that, that I would agree because it, the way you would determine that, that would be an interesting study to do, is to look at in the book of Acts at what, what they call the we sections where the writer says we, indicating that he's with Paul while the events are occurring. Mm -hmm. So whatever whatever that Luke understood about the mystery, he, he no doubt learned it from being there and listening to Paul preach. So yeah, I, 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 I think you're making a good point there. Anything else about chapter 4? Yeah. Well, just on Beverly's thing, the, I think isn't Second Timothy the last book that Paul wrote? Yes. Second Timothy chapter four, um, verse eleven. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable to me for the ministry. Yeah, Luke is a longtime companion of Paul. So whatever Luke knew. There's, there is no, no verse anywhere that says Luke ever received specific revelation. Luke, to me, is an example of what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 3. That he gets the information, he teaches it, and then it's the responsibility of those that hear it to do what? To teach it. Okay, And that's how it's going to be passed on. So, also, I, like I said to you a couple weeks ago when we were looking at the O'Hare book by Haggai, hey, yeah, I don't know anybody that says that no one else understood the mystery. What most dispensate, what most rightly dividing dispensationalists, either Acts 28 or Mid-Acts, will say is that he was the first one to know it. Now, whether that they disagree, maybe as far as the timing of when he knew it. But I don't think that there's anybody that argues in those two sort of uh, understandings that he wasn't the first one to know it. Okay, That once he knows it, then he teaches it out. Just go, go see that. Go to Ephesians 3 quick, and then I'll get your question in one second, Mike. Ephesians 3. Verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, uh, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to who? Mm -hmm. To me. Then he says, to who? You. To you were. So it was given to who first? Oh. Paul. And then it's Paul's job to do what? Spread the word. Dispense it out. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote it for in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now what? Revealed Reveal unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So how? So clearly, who got it first? Paul. Paul. I mean, if words mean anything, that's what he's saying. That's his yeah. own testimony about it. Okay. So anyway, Mike, you had a question. Oh, I, I without getting us too sidetracked, what is your opinion? Was Luke a, a Gentile or a Jew? That's a good question. I, uh, I don't know that I have an comes, answer. That comes up every once in a while. I don't know that I have a good answer for that off the top of my head. So any other? Yeah, Fred? The, the end of verse 5 is something that I've always had a question about. Uh, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. Yeah. That includes more than Paul, right? Paul, Paul gets it first. And they're clearly, if you look at, if you study the, the gifts... There, there, for a time in the early stages of the church, the gift of prophet and, and apostle were still functioning. And so there were others that were out teaching that also, but they did not get that information before Paul did. For sure. It was revealed unto them. Yeah. By the Spirit. I don't think that the language would allow us to necessarily presume who the Spirit revealed it to first, even though Paul says that the Spirit revealed it to him. Paul also says that the Spirit revealed it to the other uh, holy apostles and prophets. 
And, and the way to test prophecy and revelation in those days was definitely let one man speak and the others test it. And so I believe that the Spirit would have had to have at least confirmed it. Even oh, yeah. If, even if Paul was the first to say it, the others would have had to confirm it or the church would not have been right in allowing it. I, I don't disagree with that. They are Paul's teaching it. There are apostles and prophets that are confirming it through the supernatural, not this hoodly do stuff that you see going on today, but through the real gift of apostle and prophet to help identify what was being said and whether or not it was scripture or whether or not it was from God or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and when Paul went back to the Jerusalem council, the verdict of the council was based upon what Peter said. When Peter said, yeah, guys, remember, this is what God revealed to me, you know, not saying that it was a full orb thing, but he at least, God definitely did reveal to Peter that the cross was for more than just the Jews. That piece of it, otherwise Peter would not have preached to Cornelius. And then Peter witnessed the Holy Spirit falling upon them, and he and he had to recognize that something else, there was more than what he had understood. Yeah, certainly, if you, you look at Acts 10, after Acts 9, and we, we don't have time to get into all, if you, there's a bunch of stuff that happens in Acts 9 that Acts 9 doesn't tell you about. Galatians 1 tells you about it. Where Paul goes and what he's doing. and Because it, it says in Acts 9, and after many days this happened. Well, what Galatians 1 tells you is what went on during those many days with, with Paul. Okay? So... We need. I want to keep pressing on because I don't want to. I want to make sure we finish these notes. These are all good questions and so on. It's not that I don't think that there's, they merit discussion, but I, I want to make sure we get through this. So chapter six. There's not a lot in chapter six. Okay, it's pretty standard that the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, in this chapter, Ironside takes issue with Bollinger's teaching that the church is not the bride of Christ. We already studied that uh, back in previous lessons. Uh, those interested in learning more about Bollinger's comments are encouraged to review uh, Bollinger's The Mystery, Secret, Truth Revealed, or Lesson 68 of the Grace History Project. Chapter 7. Do baptism, the Lord's, do baptism and the Lord's Supper have any place in the present dispensation of the grace of God? For Ironside, the answer to the above question is yes. Ironside views the preaching of the gospel and water baptism as being in inseparably linked throughout the Old Testament. New Testament. New Testament, sorry. In addition, he teaches that water baptism is an outward expression of faith in the gospel. Lastly, he teaches that the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision are just two different aspects of the same gospel. Quote, wherever the gospel is preached, baptism is linked with it, not as part of the gospel, for Paul distinctly says, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, but as an outward expression of faith in the gospel. It is evident in the book of Acts that there is a somewhat different presentation of this according as to whether the message is addressed to Jews in outward covenant relationship with God or to Gentiles who are strangers to the covenants of promise. Paul calls these two aspects of the one gospel, the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. The Jew being already a member of a nation uh, which up to the cross had been recognized in a covenant relationship with God, and who called and who called up, sorry, was called upon to be baptized to save himself from that untoward generation. That is to that is to step out, as it were, from the nation, no longer claiming national privilege, nor yet being exposed to national judgment. With the Gentile, it was otherwise. He was simply call, called upon to believe the gospel, and believing it, to confess his faith in baptism. And this abides to the end of the age, as our Lord Himself clearly declared in the closing verses of Matthew 28, there has never been any change in the order. Okay, so you would expect Him, obviously, to say that. That shouldn't come as a surprise, especially after what we looked at last week. In his extended comments on the necessity of water baptism in this dispensation, Ironside echoes many of the same arguments used by Haggai in O'Hareism. First, unless spirit baptism is explicitly stated in the context, water baptism is to be implied. Second, the one baptism of Ephesians 4 is taken to mean the one baptism by which we express our allegiance to the Lord uh, and that faith. And i got a lengthy quote here about this. 
quote, quoting now again from Ironside, it has been said that the baptism of the Holy Spirit superseded water baptism. But Scripture teaches the very contrary. Cornelius and his household were baptized with the Holy Spirit when they, when they believed the word spoken by Peter. But the apostle, turning to his Jewish brethren, immediately asks, Who can forbid water to these to these should not be, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, and they at once and they were at once baptized by authority in the Lord Jesus, uh, which is what which is what the expression in the name of involves. This was not a meritorious act; it was a it was a blessed and precious privilege granted to this Gentile household upon the evidence of their faith in Christ. It has been objected that the Apostle Paul himself makes light of baptism and was really glad that he had not baptized many at Corinth. It is surely a most shifty kind of exegesis that would lead anyone to make such a statement. In the record in Acts, where we read of Paul's ministry in Corinth, we are told that many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Paul did not himself do the baptizing, save in a few instances, but he certainly saw that it was done, and the Holy Spirit evidently quotes the record with approval. Why, the, why then did Paul thank God in 1 Corinthians that he had baptized so few? The answer is perfectly plain, because the Corinthians were making much of human leaders, and he saw the tendency to glory in man. He knew that if there, he knew that if there were many there who had been baptized by him, they would be more likely under the, under the prevailing conditions to pride themselves upon the fact that he, the apostle of the Gentiles, had been the one who baptized them. But far from making light of baptism, he chides them for their sectarian spirit. He shows, he shows, them, that they, he shows them that the only name worthy of exaltation is the name of the one by whose authority they had been baptized. As to the various disputed scriptures in Romans 6, Colossians 2, Ephesians 4, and Galatians 3, where baptism is mentioned without any definite indication as to whether it is water or spirit, one thing is at least perfectly clear. Water baptism is necessarily implied. So he's doing the same thing that Haggai did. He says, unless it says spirit baptism, it's always what? Water. 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 It's implied, he says. Because spirit, spirit baptism is but a figurative expression, and water baptism was the act upon which the figure was based. This comes out of the first mention of spirit baptism. I indeed, says John, baptize you with water. This then was the actual literal baptism. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It is not literal baptism in the spirit. It is not literal fire, but figurative. You could dispute that, by the way. If this be kept in mind, there would be no confusion. Baptism in water pictures, in baptism in water, pictures both burial and resurrection. On this, Paul bases his instruction in Romans 6 and Colossians 2. Thus, water baptism marks people out as belonging to Christ by profession, and therefore uh, is the basic thought of Galatians 3.27, even though, even though it is by the Spirit's baptism that people are actually united to Christ. There, have been, there has been much uh, disputation <coughs> regarding the passage in Ephesians 4, but without laying sp uh, special stress on the importance of water baptism, it is very evident that the passage would have no meaning if water baptism as well as the Spirit were not in view. Let me try to make this plain. In the opening verses, the Apostle calls upon the Ephesian believers, and of course all Christians, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they have been called, and, lay, and he lays stress on the importance of endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Then he explains this, by, then he explains this unity as being sevenfold. In verse 4, he examines three special things, one body, one spirit, one hope. Now there can be no question that the Spirit is brought in here as forming the body. And the Spirit forms the body by what is called elsewhere baptism of the Spirit. Then in verse 5 we have another trio, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Here it seems to me clearly, here it seems to me clearly enough we have not a duplication of what we have already had in verse 4, but something that is more outward. 
our Lord, uh, one Lord in whom we believe, one faith that we confess, and one baptism with which we express our allegiance to the Lord and that faith. In verse 6, we have God himself as the, as the Father of all, the founder of this blessed unity. Now, without going into any disputation as to whether the term one baptism is to be confined to the baptism of the Spirit or the baptism of water, it is certainly evident it at least implies water. No man confesses his faith in Christ by baptism of the Holy Spirit alone. For millions, for millions have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, and yet the world knows nothing of it. On the other hand, of course, many have faith in Christ who have never been baptized in water, but that does not alter the fact that according to the Lord's own instructions, water baptism uh, should follow confession of Christ. The Lord has never rescinded this order. For men to attempt to do so is to substitute human authority for divine. Sorry to get a drink after reading all that. It's pretty clear what he's saying. He is basically presenting the standard Acts 2 understanding of water baptism, what, why it is significant, and why it should be done. There's nothing really new here that differs uh, very much from what Haggai said about the subject when we looked at the O'Hareism booklet. So, finishing this point, Ironside concludes <coughs> chapter 7 by taking issue with Bollinger's teaching on the Lord's Supper. Bollinger argued that the Lord's Supper, like baptism, has no place in the dispensation of grace. For the record, J.C. O'Hare never accepted Bollinger's view. That should, this is a typo. You should Lord's say on the Lord's Supper, not water baptism. So we need to make sure we change that. So, in fact, I will think. I think I will demonstrate to you that the thing that brings O'Hare away from toying with Acts 28 view is the issue of the Lord's Supper. Okay? And I think, I think I can prove that to you fairly conclusively uh, by looking at the writings of O'Hare in a couple weeks. So, very quickly, are there any questions about the point here with respect to baptism? Does this still just come down to not seeing the division? Well, here I think you have a few things going on. Number one, you have... You have the inclination to say anytime you see the word baptism and you don't see the word spirit it automatically means water that's definitely a factor go ahead he really seems to be hanging on to water baptism because Jesus said water baptism I think he's hanging on to it Steve because he if in order for I mean when my when my dad first saw it, that was the one of the biggest things that came out of people's mouths in Tip City, Ohio was, well, I I'm going to be water baptized because Christ was water baptized. Yeah, and that's a common thing that you hear. But I think with respect to the book and the arguments that he's making here, okay. if he is go, he has to say that water baptism is for this aid or this dispensation. Because otherwise, everything that he said previous about the Great Commission, about all the things that we looked at last week, would be totally undermined if he doesn't say these things. And you weren't here last week, but we, we, de that's fine. we demonstrated, though, I think, that in trying to disprove what he calls ultra-dispensationalism, he's coming up with things that the rest of his fellow Acts 2 dispensationalists would not necessarily agree with. Okay? Maybe not about baptism specifically, but some of the other things we looked at dispensationally last time, for sure. Yeah. Um, this might take up a lot of time, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, it is a major question for me, do you mind? Well, you can ask it, and then if we have to <laughs> answer it, we can do that. Okay. The, the last statement of the Ironside quote, the Lord has never rescinded this order and for men to attempt to do so is but to substitute human authority for divine. Um, in Paul's writings, he clearly tells us we are not under the law but under grace. That's spelled right out. You can quote it and, and you can answer anybody's questions based on that verse. Um, he says that circumcision avails nothing. 
he, he says that the Sabbath was but a foreshadowing of the rest of Christ. He, he plainly tells us no, 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 no about the, the Jewish things that aren't supposed to be a part of the church anymore. The only thing about baptism is implied by the dispensational um, figuring out when the dispensation changed and recognizing that Paul has said, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you. And I believe that the context of when Paul does say it is fully explained by the fact that the reason he was glad he hadn't baptized many was because then they would say, I baptized you in my own name. And to me, that just is not a sound argument that God is um, disgusted with the fact that the church is still baptizing. Okay, there's a couple things. I'm going to try to just, I'll say a few things about it, and then if you want to talk about it more afterwards, we, we can do that. Is that okay? First of all, I think that the church by and large has misunderstood what baptism was for. Because if you study the gospel of the kingdom, baptism was never an outward sign of an inward commitment. It was a required piece of the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. They, they, there was no, there was, it wasn't as though, well, you know, I think I want to be water baptized, or I don't think I want to be water baptized. It was, it was part of what God was telling them to do. So when that dispensation changes, and Israel refuses to repent and is ultimately set aside, the, the, the content of the gospel changes as well. And, and so I don't, there, are, there are also no verses anywhere that teach that baptism was ever an outward sign of an inward commitment. Baptism, according to the Old Testament and according to what is said in the Gospels and in the early Acts, is part of what God is requiring Israel to do so that he can form the kingdom of priests and a holy nation that he intends Israel to be. So when Israel falls, when Israel is set aside, that was part of their program just as much as, and it was in the law that, that they had to go through these things. So I think that in, in quick, that's what I'll say. I'll give you an opportunity to say what you want and then we'll move on. How about that? Is that fair? Yes. <laughs> But the point is that that has always um, left me unconvinced in my own mind, heart, and conscience is that for all the other stuff that we were supposed to stop doing, God told us plainly to stop it. Okay. That, that, yeah. But even though it's never... <clears throat> the one baptism is the spirit baptism that Paul speaks about. He never promotes baptism as part of self. You know, like you said, it's never a mandate of Paul for people to keep baptizing either. I, I mean, think, he's very he's very silent on the subject either way. Look, I, I think, I think Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie is asking a, her. Her question is yeah. a good question. I mean, yeah. and it's a question that that if this it, that has to be that has to be answered. I right. think there is an answer for it. Okay, yeah. I think the answer is to accurately understand what water baptism was, mm -hmm. what it was for, identify when it was preached, why it was preached. I mean, Mark sixteen: He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why would he say that? Well, Matthew, Mark chapter one. Uh, John, John goes out into the regions of uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and it says that the gospel of the kingdom is repent for the time is at hand. You know, I'm messing it up, but you, you, you know what I'm saying. So I think that there is an answer for that. Now, whether or not all the things that have ever been said about that are good or answers or not, maybe that's another matter of discussion. But I think that for me personally, in, in the way I understand it, that was a requirement of that those people during that during that dispensation. It says in the Gospels that that um, the law and the prophets were until John, but since that point, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Jesus tells the, the the Pharisees in Luke. He says that to the Pharisees and lawyers that they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. Um, so. 
I think that it was a requirement of the gospel of the kingdom. It was a preparation of forming the kingdom of priests. And I think all of it has to do with what God was trying to accomplish through the nation of Israel. Now, Israel refuses to repent. They are rendered in unbelief. They are set aside. God reveals the mystery and starts doing something that he previously had not spoken about. And I think that, and you are, I think you are also right in the sense that he never, Paul's not out promoting that people be water baptized. Um, so, wherever that leaves us, I guess that's where it, it leaves us. Yeah. Just one more comment in light of what Beth has said. Um, being kind of a genealogy research kind of person and always tracing things back, I've over the last few years, whenever I read Paul's writings and he's referring to somebody specific or to a group specific and talks about when they came to faith, I've gone back to Acts to find the record of when they came to faith. For instance, when he says, um, I think it's in Galatians, did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith or by works of the law? And so I went back to read when the Galatians were converted and they were all baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And, and, and even in the, um, I don't have the Bible with me where I've got all this noted on the margins, but, but every, every place where Paul refers to someone having received the Spirit, when I go back to the book of Acts to look at the record, those people were water baptized also. And I just think that, that, that there isn't evidence that Paul ever stopped baptizing or, or ordering baptism. I think there is no evidence of that. And I think that, that so, simply based upon, well, the dispensation had to change here, and therefore, it, because we know they baptized under the kingdom um, dispensation, then they must have stopped. But I don't see any evidence that they did ever stop. Okay. What you're bringing up is what leaves some people to conclude the X-28 position. Okay, because they'll say, well, Acts 28, all that stuff stopped. And Stan, or, uh, O'Hare himself is going to make that argument. So, you're, it's a good question, Ronnie. I, don't, I, I know you're not necessarily satisfied with, with my answer. And I'm not trying to convince you. It, it was sort of an off-the-cuff question that I wasn't totally, you know, obviously ready to, yeah. to, 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 to give an answer to. But uh, I do appreciate the questions. Let's go back now to the bottom of page 5. Ironside changes his mind. In the controversy, Stam devotes an entire chapter to chronic chronicling, quote, the about face in the dispensational teaching of Ironside. Stam accomplishes this by quoting in parallel columns comments made by Ironside before the 1935 publication of Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth and after. Moreover, on May 20, 1935, Pastor O'Hare drafted a pair of letters addressed to, addressed to Ironside objecting to his portrayal of, quote, ultra-dispensationalism in the Word of God, in, in, sorry, wrongly dividing the Word of Truth. O'Hare wrote, wrongly deriding Christian brethren to address the subject of the dispensation of the mystery raised by Ironside and, how do you say this word? Purial and childish diatribes to address his teaching on water baptism. Lastly, Pastor Stam informs his readers that he first encountered Ironside's book in 1937, and that as the circulation of wrongly dividing grew, he published excerpts from his earlier writings under the title Dr. H. A. Ironside's Former Testimony as the Pauline Truth. The Grace History Project believes that it is quite possible that this pamphlet by Stam, to which Ironside, that sorry, let me read that again. The Grace History Project believes that it is quite possibly this pamphlet by Stam, to which Ironside refers to in the preface of the third edition of Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, printed in April 1938. So, the following chart. The following chart is a hybrid. Okay, and what I mean by hybrid is I took some of it from Stam's book, The Controversy, along with multiple editions of my own that I have taken that Stam did not discuss. Now, we obviously 
are not going to have time. I mean, this goes on here for about uh, two and a half pages almost. And looking at the clock, I don't think we're going to have, we won't have time to look at all of these, okay? But I want to explain what this is. So, you know that the, the lesson is titled Rightly Dividing Ironside. So I sort of got the idea to do this from looking at what Stam did, but I've, like I said, I've amended it, and ex not amended what Stam did, but expanded it by including more references to works than what um, he did. So in the left-hand column, you have the testimony of Ironside before the writing of Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth in 1935, okay? In the right-hand side, you have his testimony after he writes wrongly dividing the word of truth in 1935. So what I've tried to do here, and then you also have for each quote, you have the book it came from, the year it was written, and the page number that you'll find it on. Okay? So what you can do here is you can compare what he said before 1935 when he wrote wrongly dividing the word and after that point. Okay? So before... So if we just do this and we say 1935 is the year before this, you have Mysteries of God. That's 1908. You have Sailing with Paul. Nineteen thirteen. And then you have uh, I just want to make sure I get Romans is next, right? And that's nineteen. 30, 1928. Yeah. Yeah. Then Colossians. And then on this side, you obviously have wrongly dividing. And that's 1935. And then you have Ephesians. And that's what, 37? Yeah. So what the chart is doing is just trying to show you how his mind, where how he changed his mind. Now the thing that is the, the craziest to me about this is that he denies ever having done this. Okay? Ironside is very, shall we say, angry at Stam and others for floating pamphlets out there like this that take his statements pre-1935 and compare it with his 1935 statements and he accuses them of misrepresenting him which is extremely hard to do when you are when you set this up in this fashion so you can see what he said in his own words Ironside is very upset about about this happening now I don't we don't have time to read all of these right now, okay? Um, in fact, it's been, a, I don't, I'm not even sure which ones we should say we should look at at the moment, but I want you to at least, if you choose to do this later on, be understanding what you're looking at in these charts, okay? Anybody have any questions about that? Yeah? What happened in 1935? You guys already covered that. Well, we're sort of in the middle of covering that. All right, never mind. What happened, Steve, in my opinion, and this is to Ronnie's point, is the baptism controversy. I think that these that, that what is partly responsible for this about face is the whole controversy about baptism that started in 1933. 1930, Haggai writes his booklet, O'Harism. 1933, as I showed you two weeks ago, is when things started to erupt uh, within fundamentalism over the issue of water baptism. Mr. Stam writes, much little, no water, and addresses it to the, to the uh, Pet Ministerial Association of the State of Illinois at re requesting time in their next monthly meeting to present his views on baptism. Okay? Um, things, are, things are really starting to heat up during that time period. All right? um, there's... Uh, Boss Lope, Thomas Boss Loper says that O'Hare and Ironside maintained fellowship for a while because Ironside himself refused to baptize anybody himself. He just had his um, 
board members or people that were working with him or under him in his ministry at Moody Church do it. So things are definitely, 1933, 1935, things are starting to happen here, and they get to a point where he feels he has to write this book. Okay? Repudiating what he's calling ultra-dispensationalism. I don't know if I answered your question or not. But this is this is sort of the powder keg decade. So he's been going along kind of with some of these guys, kind of agreeing with them until this water baptism thing blows up and he has to pick a side. It would seem, if you just read these, that the stuff he says here, compared with the stuff he says here, there's there's got to be some reason why he would change his mind. He picked a side. Uh, if you want, yeah, I guess. I, I, I don't know how else you want to look at it. I, I'm, he picked a side. I, I guess that's he was He was on, on the fence and kind of agreeing and then just realized that he had to pick one side or the other and that's the side he picked. That we, I mean, that's just speculation. It's somewhat, it, I would say it's educated guessing speculation. <laughs> <laughs> any... any I wish we had time to read all these, but we but we don't. Let's just uh, let's see here. We've already read a bunch of these statements out of wrongly dividing, but if you go down to the ones, even the ones from Ephesians, they're just echoing the stuff that he had already said when he wrote wrongly dividing the word of truth. So it's it's pretty clear that he changes his mind, and he's mad. He is mad at Stan. He is mad at anybody that is trying to point out the fact that he's reversed his, his teaching, okay? You, you, if you read the, the preface to, to uh, the third edition, he's, he's obviously not happy about it. Yeah? Well, um, from some stuff Mike was reading to me last night at home out of O'Hare, it seems to me that, that all these guys get really mad if anybody points out to them, hey, look, you aren't, you, you've, you've thought differently throughout your life. You know, why do they get so upset about why can't they just go, yeah, you know what? You are right. Growing in truth. O'Hare got gets O'Hare gets mad too. I mean, you'll see it next week when we look at uh, the entire lesson next week is about O'Hare's response to this book, to Ironside's book. Okay. That's why I love listening to Bill DeWitt teach. He'll tell you right up front he's not sure what he believes. Well, it's funny you bring him up. <laughs> because there's a better than 80% chance he'll be sitting in here next Sunday. Really? Yeah! I think I've convinced him to come to class. He's, he's arriving in town tomorrow. He's intending to spend all month uh, in, in Grand Rapids. He's going to be uh, doing some more research in the Baltimore Library. And um, he's requested that he he has a request on the proposition on the table that he and I co-author an article about O'Hare's thinking in the 1930s. Um, and so we're going to be meeting and having dinner and I'm going to be going to hear his presentation uh, at the leadership con the GGF leadership conference on March 20. But he said that he at least is tentatively planning on attending any of the O'Hare lessons that we're going to be going over the, during the three weeks that he's in town. So. You might see him. I would be awesome. Week. I haven't yeah. seen him in years. Um, on O'Hare, I just asked Mike yesterday, and we didn't bother to try to figure it out. Did, was O'Hare married? Did he have kids? What became what became of him? Oh, his family. I. He was the. I don't know. Off the I, he was married. I know he was married. Shouldn't Richard know? No. Well, I'm just thinking back. I know for a fact he got married. Um, as far as the children go, I'm not sure about that. Because we gotta find that library yet, right? <laughs> I don't think he had any children. You don't think he had children? Oh. <laughs> so let's conclude here on page eight. So I want I want you to see here what's going on. So according to Pastor Stam. The publication of Dr. H. A. Ironside's former testimony as the Pauline Truth so enraged the doctor that he sent him the following letter dated September 18, 1940. Okay? Quote, Dear Mr. Stam, My attention has been drawn to your contemptible effort to make my teaching, which is unchanged through the years, as to the mystery, agree with the unscriptural Bollingerite theories you are advocating. 
As one who loved and esteemed your noble father, I am grieved to think that a son of that that his, that a son of his would stoop to such methods. I teach today just what I taught in the books you quote from. But these teachings are as far removed from Bollingerism as from Seventh-day Adventism. Can you not read? In my book, Wrongly Dividing, I am referring not to the mystery of the body, but to the mystery that Jew and Gentile are both saved on the, on the ground of pure grace as common to all the apostles. So uh, now there's a different definition of the mystery, but anyway. <laughs> this mystery, not the mystery of the body, was clearly enunciated by the apostle Peter as recognized truth in Acts 15.11, and this Peter had preached from the beginning. So he's saying that what Peter said happened to him in, in Acts 10 was what Peter had been preaching the whole time. The preface to the second edition of Wrongly Dividing makes this clear for those who read the first edition carelessly and leaves no excuse for such ignorance now. You are making a sorry spectacle of yourself by trying to build up a reputation as a teacher through attacks on men of God, many of whom were in Christ and preaching the mystery of the body before you were born. God grant you, God grant you may see your folly and retrace your steps before you go the full length as others have done and wind up where Bollingerism leads in universal reconciliation and the denial of all practical truth uh, for the conscience. Whoa. Sincerely yours, H.A. Ironside. <laughs> He's mad. Now, I, I challenge you, okay? You take that chart home and you read it. You compare the statements and you decide for yourself whether or not he changed his mind, okay? I provided for you the name of the book, the year the book was written, and the page number for each statement that, that's included. Okay. Now, before we close, I should just ask, are there any other questions, comments, or anything for the good of the order that is out there with respect to H.A. Ironside, this whole concept of him changing his mind, or anything that he says with respect to wrongly dividing? Mm -hmm. In the opening... Were sentence of the letter to Mr. Sam from Mr. Iron, Dr. Ironside. Um, if you take out the parentheses, which is clearly the thing that he, you know, him and O'Hare both say, I never changed my mind when it's obvious they did. He is stating that the thing he's mad about and that what he considers to be a contemptible effort is to make his teaching as to the mystery agree with Bollingerism. Not, he's he's not saying that he, it's a contemptible effort to prove that I changed my mind. He's saying it's a contemptible effort to try to make my teachings uh, agree with Bollingerism. If well, you take out the parentheses, that's what you have to do if you diagram. The his sentence. his teachings were his yeah I understand, but his teachings were his teachings. So whether or not that's. So if that is what he's upset about, he still can't get around what he had previously taught, even though he would now go back and look at those books and say, oh boy, I was teaching Bollingerism. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the thing. So it's like, that what's was, going on here? Uh, perhaps he really did not recognize that he was leaning that way. But see, this is the point, okay? Yeah. At, th this is the bigger point I want to get you to see. In 1935, <clears throat> You should really be getting the impression that these men are functioning like there are only two options. Okay? That there's an Acts 2 option and there's an Acts 28 option. None of them seem to have dawned on them that there might be another what? Option. Option. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like even today sometimes some people are like, oh, we can't agree with anything that the Catholics say because they're the Roman Catholics, you know? But some of what they teach is correct. And, and it's like uh, if we're mid-Acts or if we're Acts 2 or whatever, oh, we can't listen to those Acts 28ers because if anything they say is right, then that's going to lead to universal reconciliation and all this other stuff. And it's like, no. Which is in and of itself a big-time jump in logic 
that just because somebody entertains the notion that the church didn't start till Acts 28, that that automatically necessitates they're going to be a universalist. That's that that is also a major step in logic. That it is not. I mean, that, that's classic like non sequitur stuff. It doesn't necessarily follow. Okay. Now, have some of the folks that have entered into that wound up there? Yes. But that does not mean that it's an automatic done deal that anybody who entertains Acts 28 view of dispensational teaching is automatically going to you know, be a universalist. Yeah, some premillennialists have sold everything they own and stood on a hilltop and waited for Christ to come back. Yeah, we studied day, them. But that doesn't make the total teaching wrong. Mike, you got to get a, no question out of it. <laughs> All right, so next week we will uh, hear O'Hare's response to Ironside, and just, just bear in mind so you're not surprised that if Dr. DeWitt is here, um, we'll just, uh, you know, warmly welcome him and stuff to uh, agreeing to be a part of the class. So thanks for your attention.